Good afternoon, colleagues. We will begin with First Minister's questions. And before we turn to the questions themselves, could I invite the First Minister to update Parliament on the government's response to the pandemic? Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, 624 new COVID cases were reported, which is 2.7% of all the tests that were carried out yesterday. And the overall number of confirmed cases now stands at 211,854. 405 people are in hospital, that's 17 fewer than yesterday, and 38 people are currently receiving intensive care, which is the same as yesterday. I regret to report that in the past 24 hours, a further seven deaths have been registered, and the number of deaths under the daily measurement is therefore now 7,536. Uh, the latest National Records of Scotland data uh, published yesterday, though, shows that the total number of deaths related to COVID is now uh, closer to 10,000. On Tuesday, the first anniversary of lockdown, uh, we will commemorate all those who have lost their lives with a minute's silence. But today, I want again to send my condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one. Uh, later today, we will also publish the latest estimate of the R number. We expect it to show that the R number is around or just below one. Uh, I can also today provide an update on the vaccination programme. I'm pleased to confirm that as of 8.30 this morning, more than 2 million people have now received the first dose of the vaccine. 41,184 people received a first dose yesterday, bringing the total first doses now to 2,023,002. Uh, in addition, 192,100 people have had a second dose, which is an increase of 10,221 since yesterday. And that means 51,405 people in total received vaccinations yesterday. Virtually all over 65-year-olds have now had a first dose so to have 74% of 60 to 64-year-olds, 44% of 55 to 59-year-olds, and 35% of 50 to 54-year-olds. Uh, now, many will have heard reports in the past 24 hours that across the UK, supplies uh, of vaccine will be lower than expected. Uh, I have had discussions in the last two days with representatives of both Pfizer and AstraZeneca. At present, we expect that over the next month, we will have approximately 500,000 fewer doses than we had previously anticipated. Uh, for that reason, there may be periods in April when we need to prioritise second doses. However, I want to be clear today that as things stand, we do still expect to offer a first dose of the vaccine to the remaining JCVI priority groups by the middle of next month as planned. And just to remind people, that is everyone over aged 50, unpaid carers, and all adults with particular underlying health conditions. And we also still expect to have offered a first dose to all adults in the population by the end of July. So when you are invited for an appointment, please accept it. Now, we've always known that supplies will be subject to some volatility, but the rollout of the programme overall continues to be really encouraging. And it does give us real cause for optimism now about the months ahead. Uh, it's because of that that we've been able to provide more details about our plans for easing restrictions and of course it's because of that that we have some reason to hope for a turn to a more normal life now over the course of the summer. All of this though depends on continued suppression of the virus so for now it's vital that everyone continues to follow the stay at home rule. Uh, when uh, we are out and about uh, it's also important to follow the facts guidance and if we all continue to do that as we vaccinate more and more people then I do think uh, we can expect that steady progression out of lockdown and a return to greater normality over the summer. Thank you very much, First Minister. Uh, I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would like to add my condolences to the loved ones of those who have died. Presiding Officer, this week we heard more allegations about the scandal engulfing Nicola Sturgeon's government. Yesterday at her press conference, the First Minister refused to address the substance, but claimed to refute the allegations. Now, it's been a while since I was a journalist, but back then, refute meant to prove a statement wrong, and I don't think its meaning has changed since then. So I'm going to ask the same question that the journalist asked yesterday, which the First Minister refused to answer, and maybe she can properly refute it now. It has been alleged that a legal document had been deliberately withdrawn, in other words, suppressed, from being handed over to a court by government officials. Is that something that the First Minister knows happened, and is that not a summary dismissal offence? 
First Minister. Um, it didn't happen, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. I'm actually quite astounded that Ruth Davidson hasn't seen uh, the position that has now been uh, narrated about that. But can I say, first of all, presiding officer, uh, that having David Davis, a Tory MP, uh, reading out in the House of Commons under the protection of parliamentary privilege uh, his old pal Alex Salmon's conspiracy theories about the sexual harassment allegations uh, against him uh, must be the very epitome Pardon of the old boys club. Uh, I have to say holding this, government, holding this government to account is vital but anyone who chooses to cheer that on should not pretend to have the interests of the women concerned at heart. Now, on to, on to the specific question about the withheld document. That claim, as the government actually confirmed yesterday, is just factually inaccurate. Uh, David, Davis, uh, David Davis uh, claimed that a document was withheld. In fact, once we tracked down exactly what document was uh, being talked about, what we discovered was that document was not withheld. That document was handed over to the court on the 21st of November 2018. Production number 7.79. So there's the answer to Ruth Davidson's question. And I would just end, presiding officer, by saying this. Parliamentary privilege might confer all sorts of protection. Unfortunately for Mr Davis, it doesn't turn falsehood into fact. Ruth Davidson. President officer, I don't deal in conspiracies, I deal in facts. And it is a fact. It is a fact that her own lawyers said it was unexplained and frankly inexplicable that information had been kept from them. And while that's ground we've tread before, there is something that she hasn't been asked about because it was only released to the Parliamentary Committee inquiry on Monday. A document dated the 4th of November, which hasn't been reported yet, and could have been released the whole time, and said, sneaked out in the dog days of the inquiry's time. Yeah, yeah. We don't know who the notes author is, because that's redacted, but we know it was sent to the very top of government, and discusses whether officials really do have to comply with their duty of candour. So let me quote directly from it. They felt it better, more credible, less shifty looking if we proceed as proposed and it goes on it will probably all end up being out there anyway and better to face it transparently than having this dragged out reluctantly and portrayed as a failed attempt at a cover-up first minister why did the government go ahead with the attempt at the cover-up anyway first minister uh I, I think everybody watching this will have noticed just how quickly Ruth Davidson moved on yeah. from the question she yeah. asked at the first uh, occasion of asking, because she stood up and suggested, as David Davis did in the House of Commons earlier this week, that a document had been withheld. And then when I pointed out to her that that was factually inaccurate, including given her the production number of the document as it was handed over to the court on the 21st of November 2018, she's got the nerve to stand up here and say she deals in facts. I think people will <laughs> see for themselves that that couldn't be further from the truth. And actually what she has just quoted, uh, what that actually means is council saying to government, uh, here's things we should hand over and we should hand them over. I think actually it was amend pleadings, uh, although I'll be corrected if I'm wrong uh, on that, rather than have any suggestion that we're trying to cover up. So what did we do? We amended the pleadings. All of this is out there, of course, uh, for people to see, because the thing is, people don't have to take Ruth Davidson's word uh, for these things anymore. They don't have to take the word of the old boys club in the House of Commons anymore. They can go on to the website of the Scottish Government, the committee of this parliament, and read all this for themselves. And then they can make up their own minds. But the fact of the matter is, David Davis made serious, specific allegations in the House of Commons this week, uh, and they have completely fallen apart. And I actually think uh, that should be something he is apologising for. He's been tweeting this morning where he's no longer even uh, trying to defend the specific allegations, he's just shifting the goalposts. Shifty is definitely a word I would use today, but I would use it in relation to David Davis and Ruth Davidson. Ruth Davidson. So the First Minister says there's no cover-up, but six weeks after the note that I read out, her own lawyers said they hadn't complied with what the court told them to do. And still, 
We know that the First Minister attended a meeting on the 13th of November 2018 with legal counsel, and all records of that meeting have either vanished or been destroyed. It is beyond anyone's imagination that no notes were taken when the First Minister, her Chief of Staff, the Permanent Secretary and Queen's Council met. Is Nicola Sturgeon seriously trying to tell us this isn't a cover-up when her own officials warned six weeks before key documents were finally dragged out of them that it would look like a failed attempt at a cover-up? When her own lawyers, under her instruction, made false statements before a judge because a key email was withheld despite emails around it in the same chain being disclosed. And when all of this would have stayed secret from the inquiry investigating it, but for the threat of John Swinney losing his job. First Minister. You know, Ruth Davidson gets more and more desperate on this issue every single week that passes. As one conspiracy theory after another is demolished and falls away, she just dredges the bottom of the barrel. The fact of the matter is here, this government did make a serious mistake. I have uh, said that on a number of occasions. It's a serious mistake. Uh, I regret deeply. I do think a point that shouldn't be lost, though, is this. It's a mistake that was made in the course of the government trying to do the right thing. You know, in the world of the old boys club, that mistake would never have been made because the allegations would never have been investigated. They would have been swept under the carpet instead. That old boys club that Ruth Davidson is soon going to see a lot closer uh, when she joins the House of Lords in just a few weeks time. The fact of the matter is scrutiny of this government on all of these things is vital and important. And as I said, people can go and read the documentation for themselves. You know, but every time that crosses over into buying into Alex Salmon's conspiracy theories, politicians have a, a choice to make there and they're entitled to choose to do that, but they shouldn't pretend in doing that that they are standing up for the women at the heart of this issue. Uh, these women were let down. I've apologised for that and I am determined to learn the lessons of it and to make sure this government learns the lessons of it. Ruth Davison. Day by day, week by week, drip by drip, more evidence comes to light over how this matter has been mishandled by the First Minister and by her government. Allegations of legal documents being deliberately concealed. We've got the lawyers acting for the Scottish Government furious at making false statements to court because key evidence was withheld even from them. And now it's claimed that the First Minister's own Chief of Staff intervened in the scandal. But we only know this because the evidence wasn't published in the Parliament, but because it was published in another Parliament altogether. The evidence does mount up, as do the government's excuses, but nothing can excuse the way that the women at the heart of this were failed, nor the taxpayers' money that was wasted. And the one thing that's not happened is anyone in this government taking the responsibility that they should. The circumstances demand that somebody loses their job over this. It could be the Permanent Secretary, it could be the First Minister's Chief of Staff, it could be the First Minister herself. But really, shouldn't it be all of them? First Minister. Well, of course, in just a few weeks' time, uh, I will put myself before the verdict of the Scottish people. That's the ultimate accountability, the accountability Ruth Davidson is running away from and never let us forget that. Now, let's, because Ruth Davidson has just stood up here uh, again uh, and mouthed another of the conspiracy theories in terms of my Chief of Staff. We heard yesterday from a complainer uh, who had asked for the help of my Chief of Staff say categorically that what was being suggested by David Davis was, and I'm quoting here, fundamentally untrue and deliberately misrepresented. Now, Ruth Davidson, week after week, stands up here and claims that for her, it's all about the women. Well, can I suggest to Ruth Davidson that if that is true, it's about time she started listening a bit more to the women at the heart of this and a bit less to Alex Salmond and his cronies. The fact of the matter is that Ruth Davidson and the Tories are not interested in the evidence over this. The day before, the day before I gave evidence to the Parliamentary Committee, uh, Ruth Davidson and her colleagues said in terms that they were not interested in anything I had to say because they had made up their minds. At the heart of this is this fact, presiding officer, 
Ruth Davidson and the Conservatives are not interested in the women. They're not interested in evidence. They're only interested in using this as a political tool because, frankly, they've got nothing positive to put before the Scottish people. That is the reality. Question two, Anna Sauer. Presenting officer, my thoughts are with all those who have lost a loved one to COVID. I also want to thank our amazing NHS staff who continue to go above and beyond. We know the pandemic has had a devastating impact on the mental health of people across Scotland. Last month, a report from the government showed that more than one in eight of our fellow Scots had reported suicidal thoughts. For people with a pre-existing mental health condition, it was more than one in three. From the last available figures, there were 833 suicide deaths in a single year. And based on early data, that number is tragically expected to rise. During the pandemic, in-person mental health support has been more limited, and the government have encouraged people to use the NHS 24 Mental Health Crisis Support Line. The First Minister says her government takes the issue of mental health very seriously. So can she tell us, over the course of the pandemic, how many calls to the NHS 24 Mental Health Crisis Hub have gone unanswered? Uh, no, I don't have that figure with me. I'm sure Anna Sarwar is about to give it. If he's not, I'm happy to uh, look into that and provide it. Any call that goes unanswered is not acceptable. I think, uh, having said that, though, uh, people working across our mental health services, including in NHS 24, do an outstanding job in very difficult circumstances, and it's important that we recognise that. Uh, there is no doubt that the impact on mental health of the pandemic has been severe and significant and the obligation on government and on the health service to respond to that in the months and probably in the years to come uh, is also uh, very significant. We published the uh, third annual report on our mental health strategy on the 15th uh, of March uh, that contained updates on the progress towards some of the central commitments that we had made. Uh, we have, for example, already achieved uh, the target we set out to invest £60 million to give every secondary school access to counselling services. We are on course to provide counsellors in further and higher education to recruit additional school nurses, uh, to expand uh, the Distress Brief Intervention Programme, uh, to include people under 18 and a whole host of other uh, actions as well, uh, including, of course, the recruitment of additional mental health staff uh, in the community. So there's a lot of work we have to do, but there is a lot of work underway to make sure that we are responding appropriately to people who need mental health support now and in the future. And that's our training officer, the, the First Minister followed the script, but the answer is 24,947. That's almost 25,000 mental health crisis calls during the pandemic where individuals have built up the courage to pick up the phone, call for help and went ignored. Today, Labour is publishing data showing the steady increase in waiting times and abandoned calls to the mental health crisis hub during the course of this pandemic. In March of last year, at the start of this pandemic, 133 calls went unanswered. In the last available month of this year, that number is 5,452, 40 times higher. These are people in crisis. And it's the same story with young people who reach out for help too. One in four children and young people referred to child and adolescent mental health services are still rejected. And for those who are successfully referred, they are supposed to be seen within 18 weeks. So can the First Minister tell us when was the last time she met the 18-week standard? Well, on the uh, missed or unanswered calls, that is not acceptable. But what Anna Sarwar will also recognise is that across a whole range of services, there will also be many more people getting access to services. But it's not acceptable that anybody who reaches out for mental health support does not get that. And we take seriously our responsibility to ensure uh, that that need is met, which is why the range of investments that I have narrated and the many uh, other investments that we are making are so important. Um, on child and adolescent mental health services, we recognised pre-pandemic uh, that waiting times for specialist services are too long, and uh, that is why we had already embarked on a significant programme of investment and reform to make sure that we had more of a focus in early intervention and prevention. So the school councillors, the counselling uh, advice services in further education 
for example, the expansion of distress brief interventions to people under 18. That is all part of that programme of work to make sure that fewer young people uh, need access to specialist services because they're getting services earlier on. Long waits are always unacceptable, uh, but there has been uh, an improvement in CAMS waiting times figures in this quarter uh, previous, uh, compared to the previous quarter, which is showing that that work to recover services uh, is underway and is making progress. So we continue to invest in this, we continue to undertake the reforms necessary, and this is a, a key area of work that I think whoever is in positions of responsibility after the election will require to continue to prioritise for some time to come. And I saw Presiding officer, the answer the First Minister was looking for is never. This government and this First Minister have never met their mental health standards for children or for adults. Failures have consequences, in this case, devastating ones. Right now, there are 1,500 children and young people in the midst of a pandemic who have been waiting more than a year for support. It's actions, not promises, that save people's lives. This issue didn't start with COVID, but it has got worse as a consequence of it. What those 15,000 children need, and what those people who made those 25,000 unanswered calls need is a parliament focused on a recovery plan for our NHS that includes mental health services. After 14 years of this government, after seven years as First Minister, does the First Minister ever wonder what Scotland could have achieved for those young people if we had focused on what united us and not what divided us? First Minister. I focus, I focus every single day on issues like that. And I do agree with Anas Sarwar. It is about actions. Um, and Anas Sarwar is, is perfectly legitimate. He's in opposition uh, questioning a First Minister. Uh, talks about the, the problems. I recognise the challenges we face in mental health, but he didn't outline a few weeks before an election a single positive solution. Uh, unlike me, I have set out the investments we're making, I've set out the reforms we are undertaking uh, to increase preventative early intervention services uh, for young people. Uh, not a single positive solution has come forward uh, from the Labour benches. In fact, just a week or so ago, we put forward a a budget where working with other parties we actually increased the investment for mental health services and Labour failed to back that budget. So I do agree very much with Anna Sarwar. It's not just about words, it's about actions and about commitment and that is what this government demonstrates each and every single day and that will be the programme and the record we put before the people of Scotland in just a few weeks time. Thank you. Question three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I join other speakers in offering my condolences to all those who have lost a loved one due to COVID uh, or been affected by the pandemic? Presiding officer, in just eight months' time, the nations of the world will descend on Glasgow to discuss what to do next to tackle the climate breakdown. Our future depends on it. The Greens have successfully pushed the Scottish Government to commit more investment in green recovery. And in Glasgow itself, I was delighted to see Green councillors secure more funds for a green recovery for the city and a legacy for the climate talks. But the climate emergency demands far more of us than this. Fundamentally, it means we need to leave fossil fuels in the ground. This week, even Boris Johnson uh, appeared to accept this, reviewing the licences for the oil and gas industry, including the option of giving no more permissions for new exploration. Scottish Greens have called for this for years, but the First Minister has resisted supporting this vital move to protect our planet. So will the First Minister finally reconsider and join the Greens in calling for an immediate end to new exploration licences in the North Sea, for undeveloped licences to be revoked, and for fossil fuel subsidies and tax breaks to be redirected to renewables? First Minister. Well, I agree with the sentiments behind Patrick Harvey's question. Of course, uh, many of these issues are actually reserved to the UK government and uh, these powers don't lie with us, particularly around uh, offshore 
exploration and licensing. But what we have to make sure we achieve uh, in the interests of people whose jobs depend on certain sectors is a just transition. I want to see that transition away from fossil fuels towards renewable sources of energy. And Scotland's transition in that respect is well underway. But we need to do that in a way that uh, supports people into new employment and doesn't leave people unemployed and also doesn't substitute our own energy for increased imports, uh, which actually adds to our carbon footprint. So there is no disagreement here about what we need to do, but how we do that matters. It matters to the jobs, the livelihoods and the living standards of many people across Scotland, and in this case, many people across the northeast of Scotland. Uh, there will be no disagreement between me and Patrick Harvey about the moral obligation on our shoulders to get to net zero within the timescale that we set out and the hard actions that are required to achieve that. And again, that is something that has this government's complete focus. Patrick Harvey. Well, a just transition means transition, and it's not compatible with continuing to go looking for ever more fossil fuels when we already know that we have far more available to us in existing reserves than we can ever afford to burn. And the Scottish Government is failing to meet climate targets, especially on areas like transport, where those hard decisions the First Minister is talking about are just not being seen. Last week, we pointed out that the First Minister's Transport Secretary was unwilling to give up his support for climate-busting road expansions, a policy that's barely changed in decades. This week, we learned that another of our ministers, the Rural Economy Secretary, was lobbying the Transport Secretary for even more. And that's hardly surprising from the Rural Economy Secretary when it comes to the environment. That's the same minister who failed to record private meetings with fish farming giants and said he'd deal with their detractors, lobbied for fox hunting on public land, supported the destruction of ancient woodland in the Cairngorms National Park, and told, and told Parliament he'd take no lessons from the Climate Change Committee. So when the First Minister says that we will do all that we can uh, to play our part ahead of COP26, why are members of her Cabinet doing exactly the opposite? First Minister. Well, the, the Minister I suspect uh, Patrick Harvey is talking about has also presided over 80% of all tree planting in the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, one of the really important things we need to do as part of our climate change ambitions. You know, the transition Patrick Harvey talks about is uh, well underway. And in fact, in many respects, Scotland is leading the way in a global sense. You know, oil and gas, we have uh, already uh, set up the uh, £62 million energy transition fund, the oil and gas uh, Transition uh, Leadership Group is driving progress on decarbonisation. Take transport, for example. We have uh, what I believe is a world-leading ambition to reduce car kilometres by 20% by 2030. That was in our climate change plan. This week, we published uh, our Housing 2040 strategy and the Heat and Buildings strategy alongside plans to invest £1.6 billion uh, over the next five years to transform how we heat our homes and buildings. So these are actions we are taking right now. Um, that's why so many other countries across the world are actually looking to Scotland for leadership, because they recognise the leadership Scotland is showing. Now, as we go further down this road to 2030 and then to 2040, 45. Those decisions get much harder, they get much more challenging and that's when we see often, not Patrick Harvey I hasten to add, but other opposition parties shy away from these difficult decisions. So as we go into a new parliament there are big things that we have to confront and face up to but the leadership that Scotland is already showing here is something that should give all of us pride as we prepare for COP in November. Thank you. Question four, Willie Rennie. This week I met teachers employed on casual, short-term and zero-hours contracts. The numbers employed in this way have mushroomed in recent years. The group speaks for thousands of teachers who are desperate for some certainty and permanent work. John Swinney met them last July. He promised, I will give you a full and proper response once I have thought through all of the implications. They are still waiting. They saw the government adverts, dreamed of nurturing young minds, but have been stuck in short-term and zero-hours contracts for years, and now they are thinking of leaving the profession. Does the First Minister believe this is treating teachers 
with respect. First Minister. Uh, no, I don't actually. Um, and I don't see any reason why teachers should be in that position. The government doesn't directly employ teachers. We provide the funding for local authorities to employ teachers. There's been almost five years now of pupil equity funding made available to schools to support uh, the employment of teachers. And of course, as a result of the pandemic in the summer of last year, we provided additional funding, which has since then supported the recruitment of over 1,400 additional teachers in our schools uh, and more than 200 support staff. In January this year, we announced a further £45 million of new funding for education recovery. And again, that funding allows local authorities to deploy more support to schools and to families eh, as this crisis continues. And they are able to use that to recruit further staff should they think that is the most appropriate way of using that funding. So uh, I'm happy to look into the specific uh, cases that Willie Rennie is raising. But given uh, that we have record numbers uh, of teachers uh, right now, uh, then I don't think there is any reason for the situation he outlines. It's always somebody else's fault, isn't it? This is not a small number of cases. This is thousands and thousands of teachers who were attracted to the profession by this government and John Swinney, who is chuntering in his seat. He shakes his head, but the EIS calls them zero-hours contracts. The group of teachers told John Swinney, this is what they told him, you have turned your back on us. One teacher works in a supermarket to make ends meet, another in a cafe. One said, I have worked hard for six years, but it is impossible to secure a permanent post. Another, I have been made temporary for the third year in a row. So we must create new permanent teaching posts to get rid of this growth in zero hours contracts and the casualisation of the teaching workforce under this government. Thousands of pupils have missed out on learning due to the pandemic. Will the First Minister, get up now, will the First Minister guarantee a job for these teachers to help the educational recovery? First Minister. There's no reason uh, that any teacher should be in that position. And now Willie Rennie says that is shifting the blame. It's just a statement of fact. The Scottish Government doesn't directly employ teachers. The employers of teachers are local authorities. And any time a minister in this government stands here and suggests we take responsibilities uh, that lie with local government, people like Willie Rennie stand up and accuse us of centralisation. But he talks about more permanent teachers. Since July last year, uh, we have seen recruited more than 1,400 additional teachers and more than 200 support staff. And they should be permanent additional staff. And that is what I am saying the funding is there to support. We've also got a higher number of teachers in our classrooms now than at any time since 2008. Uh, that's the case because we're providing the funding to local authorities to employ more teachers. And I would encourage local authorities to make sure that as they employ teachers, they give permanent jobs to teachers because we're going to need more teachers in our schools for a long time to come as we continue the work of improving education for all. Thank you. Question five, Alistair Allen. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is regarding the impact on Scotland of reported figures indicating that the barriers and uncertainty created by Brexit have had an impact on commercial activity between the UK and Europe. First Minister. Uh, the recent HMRC UK trade figures are a very stark illustration of the unfolding costs of Brexit and the catastrophic impact of the UK deal on Scotland's businesses. Uh, they confirm what stakeholders and exporters have been telling us since January, that these are not just teething troubles. Uh, the deal has created permanent new barriers to trade. It places Scotland's exporters in particular at a permanent competitive disadvantage and it's causing long-lasting damage to the economy. And the unilateral announcement last week that extended the grace period on customs and other checks for imports from the EU effectively told our exports that they no longer, uh, exporters, that they no longer matter uh, to this UK government. So let me be clear, they matter to us and we will continue to do all we can to help businesses adapt to these unprecedented challenges. But the UK government really needs to re-engage in good faith with the EU to try and address all of the barriers, adding costs and causing exports to fall. Uh, to do nothing is not acceptable and frankly Scotland's export businesses deserve so much better. I thank the First Minister for that answer. I was recently contacted by a salmon smoker in my 
constituency which reports to the European Union via air freight for items retailing at £150 on average. Post-Brexit, they have found that delivery and customs charges are now coming to around £100. That figure doesn't include the additional costs uh, around health certificates or the significant amount of time they're now devoting to admin work or the fact that their deliveries are getting stuck in customs. Does the First Minister agree that, having recklessly placed Scottish food and drink businesses at a competitive disadvantage, the UK Government should now ensure that those businesses get the urgent support and compensation that they deserve? First Minister. I do very much agree with that, and Alistair Allen is narrating a sadly all too common example of the, the devastating real world consequences of Brexit, particularly for our smaller food and drink producers. Uh, the Tory government is currently refusing to get back round the table with the EU. Uh, Michael Gove, uh, in one of their many empty promises, said that they would pull out all the stops to help businesses, and they have completely failed to do that. Uh, they also promised that the UK government would meet all of the Brexit costs, and they're failing to do that as well. Uh, Brexit is right now, just as many people predicted, failing Scotland's economy, uh, and Boris Johnson's government is refusing to even try to fix things. And it's our food and drink businesses and our rural and island communities who are paying a really heavy price, uh, which is just uh, one more of many reasons why the sooner Scotland is in charge of our own future, the better for everyone. Question five, Graeme Simpson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what plans the Scottish Government has to revitalise the airline sector. First Minister. Well, we recognise that globally, not just in the UK, the aviation industry faces one of the longest recovery periods uh, given the impact of COVID on route networks. That's why we've extended the 100% non-domestic rates relief for the aviation sector for another year. And we've also provided training development support to help provide training for staff in the sector. We're working closely with airports to rebuild connectivity for business and inbound tourism once we're able to safely lift travel restrictions. Transport Scotland, Visit Scotland and SDI are working to help our airports recover routes lost as well as help secure new ones. Now more than ever, it's essential that we're well connected to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world. So we want to help uh, airports uh, restore levels of connectivity as quickly as possible. But it is vital that it is done safely in order that we don't reverse our progress on COVID. Graham Simpson. Thank you. The First Minister promised a lockdown exit strategy based on data and not dates. And so far, the aviation sector has had neither. Airports are telling us they won't be able to sustain losses for much longer. Airlines are already considering moving aircraft and jobs out of Scotland to places they have certainty of flying from. We risk turning the clock back decades. There was a hastily convened Scottish Government working group this week which heard from officials that there may be restrictions on flying for the rest of the year. Is that the First Minister's position? Those from the sector have said they urgently need an aviation recovery plan, so will the First Minister provide one? First Minister. Well, first of all, Graeme Simpson talks about certainty. I would love nothing more than to give people, including the aviation sector, certainty, but we are in a, a global pandemic of an infectious virus, and it's not possible to do that. Other parts of the UK that uh, often uh, are described as giving certainty, I don't think have done that either. I took part in a Four Nations call last night, chaired by Michael Gove, who was at pains to say that the 17th of May date for the UK government was not set in stone, and it would depend on the state of the virus. That is just the reality of the situation we face. And the situation we face right now is that we are suppressing the virus domestically, although uh, we're not complacent about that given trends in the last uh, week. We are rolling out a vaccination programme and that's going really well, although we're not complacent about that given uh, recent uh, indications about interruptions to supply. But one of the biggest risks we face is importation of the virus from overseas, and in particular, importation of new variants that might undermine the effectiveness of our vaccines. Now, Graeme Simpson might think I should simply ignore that, but it would not be responsible to do that. What we are trying to do is invest in all sorts of different processes to try to, to mitigate against those risks in other ways. Yesterday, I announced uh, new funding for a new genomic sequencing centre in Scotland that will give us much faster access uh, to sequencing 
of uh, viral strains so that we know whether new variants are coming in. But there is no quick fix to this. There's no magic wand solution to this. And anybody, frankly, uh, who suggests that there is, is being deeply irresponsible and doing a great disservice, not just to people generally, but I actually think to the aviation sector as well. Thank you. Question seven, Neil Findlay. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will adopt the Scottish May Survivors Charter. Minister. I have seen the Charter and we certainly are committed uh, to meeting the aims of uh, the Charter. We want to offer people an appointment as, uh, sorry, I um, find the right uh, question here. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that we offer uh, appointments as uh, quickly uh, as we can. Uh, my apologies. <laughs> I want to give this is a really important issue, so I wanted to make sure I was reading uh, the right information. Um, we are uh, committed to meeting the aims of the Charter. We have already taken decisive action to improve services for uh, women suffering mesh complications, and we're working towards meeting uh, all of the outcomes that the Charter seeks. Uh, the Health Secretary uh, halted use of transvaginal uh, mesh in 2018. We're committed to keeping that halt in place. Uh, we've established a mesh fund. Uh, the Health Secretary has asked that the necessary steps are taken to extend the remit of the fund to allow reimbursement of past mesh removal surgery and a comprehensive service for mesh complications and removal is now in place and that will continue to develop in consultation with affected women. NHS Scotland has already started a tender uh, process for mesh removal surgery provided outside the National Health Service for those who feel unable to accept treatment in the NHS and tenders will be accepted from the UK and overseas. And lastly, we are committed to establishing a patient safety commissioner as recommended in the Cumberledge report. Thank you. Neil Finlay. Um, the script that the First Minister eventually got, I think she may want to go back and look at that and correct to the record, because some of that, frankly, bears no relevance to reality. It is eight years since mesh injured women... Uh, it took eight years for mesh injured women to secure a meeting with the First Minister. Every small advance that they have made has had to be fought for and scrapped for. And now they have been told in a letter from the Cabinet Secretary that they cannot get treatment from a surgeon of their choice, someone that they trust and who they know has the skills required to remove the poison that has destroyed their lives. The government talks about putting the patient at the centre and person-centred care. You won't find a single mesh-injured woman who believes that this is not just corporate sales patter. All leaders of parties in this parliament have signed the MESH Charter. Why haven't you signed it, First Minister? First Minister. Uh, I, I am very happy uh, to give my support to the MESH Charter. What I was trying to do, and, and to do it accurately, uh, was set out the ways in which we are already taking forward the aims of that charter and uh, Neil Finlay who with others in this chamber uh, have championed rightly the interests of women who have been badly let down um, says there is more to do there but in terms of the key asks of the charter uh, we are making progress uh, on all of these and in the ones where we are not yet the health secretary has already given instructions for example the reimbursement of uh, the cost of mesh removal surgery for us to find a way of doing that probably through an extension of the remit of the fund that has been set up. So uh, the use of MESH has been halted. There is absolutely no intention to go back on that. The MESH fund, which we actually established after I had met with uh, affected women, uh, has been set up. Uh, we are looking to extend its remit. Uh, the issue about uh, surgery, the comprehensive service it has now been put in place but we recognise not all women will want to accept uh, treatment in Scotland which is why we're looking to establish a service uh, and are tendering for a service uh, from potentially outside of Scotland um, and taking steps to appoint a patient safety commissioner. So we are determined that all of the things that rightly uh, those women let down here want are progressed and are delivered. Um, and we will continue to take all the steps necessary to achieve that. Thank you. We take some supplementary questions. Bob Doris to be followed by Alexander Burnett. Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I have previously raised the plight of my Springburn constituent, Georgie Kakava. A young man, now 13 years old, his mother tragically passed away in 2018. Georgie was three when they arrived in Scotland, fleeing danger. 
Georgie and his grandmother were granted leave to remain by the Home Office in 2018, but this has now expired. Once again, they will have to apply for permission for the right to stay in Scotland. Does the First Minister agree with me that, given the ordeal Georgie has already been through, given Glasgow has been his home since Georgie was three years old, given their friends are here and the family are a valued part of the Springburn community, that the Home Office should move quickly to end the uncertainty over their future and confirm the right of Georgie and his grandmother to stay in Scotland permanently. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I, I do agree. I hope everybody in this chamber will agree. Georgie is, as far as I'm concerned, Scottish. This is his home and he should get to stay here for as long as he wants to be here with his grandmother. Um, Georgie and his grandmother are just one of many families that fall victim to a UK government policy that sees family migration as some kind of burden on society. Um, we want to see a very different approach. We've set out our own uh, policies for a much more compassionate and flexible approach to cases, particularly cases involving young people, uh, children who were either born in Scotland or who have spent their formative years here should have the opportunity to stay here uh, with their adult guardians. So I think that's a, a fundamental, simple principle, and it's a principle based on what is right, but it's also in our interest. We are a country that needs to encourage people to come here and make a contribution to our society and our economy. So we should be making it easier for people at Georgie to stay here, not more difficult. Um, again, it's one of the many reasons why Scotland does need to be in charge of these things ourselves, so we can have a compassionate, humane immigration policy uh, that is not just right in terms of the values that underpin it, but are actually in the best interests of our economy and society as well. Alexander Burnett, to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and in the same vein of flexibility uh, about immigration. Uh, my constituents in the third trimester of their pregnancy, uh, and she'll be shortly not allowed to fly anymore. Uh, she's returning to Scotland next week from Hong Kong and needs to know urgently uh, if she's going to be exempt from a hotel quarantine along with her 18-month child. Presiding uh, if the member wants to send me the details of his constituents' case, we'll have it looked at uh, specifically over the course of uh, today and get back to him as soon as possible. Thank you. Joanne Lamott, followed by Christine Graham. Thank you. As Scotland emerged from the first lockdown, I highlighted my concerns to the First Minister that care packages, which had been withdrawn as the virus took hold, were being reduced or ended, effectively cuts to assess support under cover of the COVID crisis. First Minister, I have a constituent whose support of £5,000 per year was withdrawn. And for context, his care for the next 10 years would still be less than the cost of coaching some Scottish government witnesses to the current parliamentary inquiry. His care was withdrawn, despite it making a difference for my constituents and making a difference to his family member being able to sustain full-time work and keep well enough to support him. Does the First Minister think this is acceptable? What advice would she give my constituents? And does she accept that her decision persistently over years to cut back funding to local councils has resulted in the basic needs of these most vulnerable people and their families not being met and under COVID that that lack of care has now reached an unbearable crisis for all too many people. First Minister. Well, firstly, Joanne Lamott's characterisation of this government's support for local authorities is just not the case. During the darkest days of austerity, uh, we treated local government fairly. Uh, it was not easy for them, but we made sure they got a fair deal. And over the course of this pandemic, uh, there has been significant additional resources made available to local government. We've made very clear, um, and the Health Secretary has, does it, has done it on many occasions, as have I, that no local authority should be using COVID uh, as a cover to cover cut care packages. So I don't think uh, what Joanne Lamont has outlined to me uh, is acceptable. And if she wants to write to the Health Secretary this afternoon, we will look into that. So I'm very clear about that. But let's also uh, be clear that we've all got a responsibility to uh, raise these cases. But this government, all through this pandemic, has said to, to members across the chamber, let us know about these cases so that where we can, we can help fix them. So that offer is there to Joanne Lamont. And if it's possible for us to fix that particular case, we will uh, do that. But the general point here is that no local authority should be cutting care packages using COVID as an excuse, and there is no reason uh, why they should be doing that. Christine Graham, to be followed by Liam Kerr. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I have cases recently, one where a Borders constituent was asked to travel a 140-mile round trip for a vaccination, and another from Gorebridge to the Edinburgh International Conference Centre requiring two buses when three minutes across the road was the local vaccination centre. Both finally after a lot of to and froing resolved. Can I therefore ask, accepting the allocation of appointments depends on vaccine availability, if there's any way appointments could make more account take more account of local vaccinating sites? So the whole programme is trying to be as flexible uh, as possible and get the balance right. We're trying to do this as quickly as possible, which is mean, means we have, particularly as we get down the age groups uh, to people who are less vulnerable and frail, centralised uh, the, the appointment system. That means some people, yes, are getting appointments at large-scale vaccination centres that may be uh, further away from where they live. And, and that is essential to do this as quickly as possible. But there is the provision to rebook appointments if uh, the appointment you get is not convenient, either not convenient in terms of the time or the location. And I would encourage anybody who's in that position uh, to phone up the helpline and rebook. Uh, their appointment um, and of course with older people and uh, frail people in particular the vaccinations have been done through primary care so that it is their own GP services they go to. I, I really appreciate that there will be a lot of people who feel that the location or time of their appointment is not as convenient as they think it should be and we're trying to get that balance right of flexibility and convenience but also the speediest possible vaccination of the largest number of people possible um, and that is the, the balance we will continue to try to strike as best we can. Thank you. Liam Kerr, followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Monday, the Scottish Government reporter overturned Aberdeen Council's unanimous cross-party decision not to build on Rubis Law Quarry, despite huge local protests and nearly 1,500 local signatures on my petition. Since May 2019, 10 separate planning applications in Aberdeen have been overturned in this way. So will the First Minister confirm, first of all, that she endorses this Rubis Law decision? And secondly, does she oppose the Scottish Conservative policy to guarantee in law that local authority planning decisions are respected, so developments are always carried out in conjunction with the wishes of local authorities. First Minister. As a matter of principle, I'm always very sceptical about backing Tory policy because usually they're pretty wrong-headed. Um, but on the serious, the serious point here, we have, we have. Uh, Ruth Davidson is from a sedentary position position, I think, thinking she's taunting me about election results that are forthcoming. Of course, she doesn't have to worry about the election results because she'll be sitting on the red benches of the House of Lords, pursuing, pursuing a political career uh, at the First, taxpayers' First Minister, expense. The question, please. Anyway, back to the question. Um, there is a serious point here that we have a, a statutory uh, process of planning uh, where there are different levels and different stages, and it's important that ministers respect that. I'm sure there are people who think that any decision on planning that a local authority takes should be respected, but I know there are many other people, uh, particularly I've had uh, instances in my own constituency, who actually like the fact that they can appeal against local authority decisions yeah. and there's a process after that. Uh, one of the things I've learned, uh, one of the many things I've learned over my many, many years in politics is that on planning in particular, uh, you will, depending on what the planning uh, proposal is, you will get some people who think that the local authority view should always prevail and you'll get some people who think it should never prevail. That's why we've got to have a proper robust, independent process in place, which we do have. Thank you. Claire Baker to be followed by John Mason. Um, thank you, President Officer. Yesterday, Flex and Fife Migrants Forum published a report into the risk of abuse and exploitation presented by the seasonal workers' pilot. It highlights serious human rights concerns in the horticultural sector in Scotland and recommendations to address them across the UK. While the scheme is the responsibility of the UK Government, and I support the calls made in the report to urgently reform the system, it does make recommendations for the Scottish Government, including calls for regulation of the accommodation sector and introducing a helpline. Can the First Minister respond to the recommendations in the report and set out how the work of Government will take them forward? 
First Minister. Uh, we will respond to the recommendations in the report. We will consider them fully. Um, I'm not able to uh, give a detailed response to each of the recommendations today, but I will undertake to have the relevant minister uh, write to the member setting out, uh, even just at this stage, our initial uh, response. Uh, I very much uh, welcome and support the, the general thrust uh, of this report, and I do think it's important that the Scottish Government, although much of this is reserved, that we take forward recommendations for us. But I'll make sure that more detail is provided as soon as it's possible to do so. John Mason to be followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as a nation, I think we face quite a challenge with repairs and maintenance of tenement property. And I, I would say that I myself live in such a property. Can the First Minister say if the Housing to 2040 report will move us forward in this regard? First Minister. Uh, yes, I think it uh, will. Uh, Housing to 2040, which we published earlier this week, uh, sets out actually the first long-term housing strategy that Scotland has had and as well as setting out the ambition to deliver a further 100,000 affordable homes by 2032, it also sets out the intention to introduce a new housing standard so that everyone uh, can accept, expect the same high standards. The new standard will support the commitment to address common standards in tenements by implementing the recommendations of the Parliamentary Working Group on Tenement Maintenance and it's our intention for the standard to apply to all tenures and including tenements, so that no one is left out of it. And if this government is returned in May, uh, we're committed to consulting on that new standard later this year. Donald Cameron, to be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you. Uh, since last summer, the closure of the A83 at the Rest and Be Thankful Pass has caused misery for residents of Argyll who use this lifeline route with months of disruption. A newly formed campaign group of a thousand local businesses have expressed their exasperation that Transport Scotland has suggested a replacement route may take 10 years to fulfil. So can the First Minister finally today commit to a firm date for completing a permanent solution along the existing A83 corridor in light of the ongoing frustration and anger felt by so many communities affected by this closure? First Minister. Well, we want to make sure this is uh, resolved definitively as soon as possible. Uh, that's why we committed to progress a long-term solution uh, to the landslide risk at the rest and be thankful. And today, actually, we've announced a preferred corridor for a long-term solution, uh, along with potential route options within that corridor for consultation. And, of course, the importance of consultation um, is one of the reasons why I can't give a, a precise timescale uh, right now. Uh, we've got to complete the necessary steps statutory processes to guarantee delivery of uh, the scheme. But we absolutely recognise the importance of this uh, to people across Argyll and Butte. And there is a determination, in fact, Mike Russell, um, as a, a constituency member uh, affected, uh, whose constituents are affected here, um, has been a real champion for this uh, within government. And uh, we will continue uh, to make sure we take this forward with all due priority. Thank you very much. Elaine Smith, to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister might be aware that my bill proposal to enshrine the right to food into Scots law received enough cross-party support last week to proceed and has been lodged, and I'll take the opportunity to thank the members who signed it. Whilst the pandemic has clearly highlighted concerns around food insecurity, food poverty, and uh, while it's highlighted those concerns, food bank usage was already surging before the lockdown. So does the First Minister agree that malnutrition and hunger, plus poor wages and conditions amongst workers in the food industry, are unacceptable in 21st century Scotland? And what priority does she place on a statutory right to food? First Minister. Uh, so I do agree uh, with much of that. Obviously, we're getting to the point where all parties across the chamber are focusing on manifestos uh, of things that we would do if we are elected in a few weeks, and certainly a statutory right to food is uh, something that I would expect to see feature in the election campaign. It's something that I think uh, is important, and uh, I will set out my manifesto in due course. Uh, we've invested heavily in trying to deal with food insecurity, but we are, as a government, and of course we've seen this parliament take a significant step in this direction uh, just in the last few days, we are uh, very keen to see incorporated into our law, uh, human rights across a, a whole spectrum, and there are perhaps uh, fewer, more basic rights than the right to food. So uh, hopefully that gives Elaine Smith some indication of where my mind is at on this. But of course, we're about to put uh, these plans, all of us, uh, or most of us are about to put these plans uh, before the Scottish people. Thank you. Emma Harper to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. 
I welcome the announcement yesterday that Scott Rail will be brought into public ownership in order to provide stability and certainty for passengers. Can I ask the First Minister what the consequences are of the serial incompetence on the part of the UK Government Ministers who have so far failed to publish the White Paper following the Williams Review? Well, firstly, I think it is uh, really positive news uh, that uh, Scott Rail will effectively come into uh, public ownership. The railways effectively will be nationalised in Scotland, and I'm proud that it's an SNP government that has set out the plans to do exactly that. Um, and one of the frustrations, though, and this is where the question is really important, is that we cannot uh, yet implement our preferred model of an integrated public sector controlled railway because of course we see delays in the consultations that the UK government have had and of course network rail still uh, lies within the control of the Scottish government so I think we are going to make significant steps in the right direction but completing the powers of this parliament over rail as well as over everything else would allow us to do so much more and go even further yet. And Jeremy Balfour. Uh, to ask the First Minister when universities and colleges across Scotland will be given sufficient information to allow them to plan their teaching schedules for the next academic year, given that timetables are normally decided at the end of this month and we can't wait till after the election. First Minister. Well, the Government uh, and uh, the Higher and Further Education Minister is in regular contact uh, with the university and college sector. Um, I set out some uh, indication on Tuesday, uh, particularly about the college sector and the return of students to in-person uh, teaching as, as part of the next phase of our exit from lockdown that is focused on college students in particular who otherwise might be at risk of, of not completing their courses um, and as it is safe to do so as the virus is suppressed and as we vaccinate more people we want to see at later stages more young people come back to campuses of universities and colleges and we'll continue to be in touch with the sector about the detail of that even through the election campaign. Thank you very much and on that note we will right, point of order Neil Findlay. Officer, in relation to the reply I received from the First Minister earlier, um, I want to raise this point of order. A number of mesh injured women went through the, all stages of the NHS process to seek agreement from the NHS to refund payments they made for mesh removal, having had surgery in the US. They, were, they borrowed, they crowdfunded or used life savings to fund it. In a letter last week from the Cabinet Secretary to Jackson Carlow, Alec Neil and myself, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed there is no route for this money to be repaid by the NHS. Now, this completely contradicts the answer that the First Minister gave at question time. So will the First Minister now look at that letter and correct it, or will she now correct what she said at question time, because both cannot be true? Thanks, Mr Finlay. I appreciate that Mr Finlay has got, is disputing the, the account, but that's just a matter of disputation. It's not a point of order. Mr Finlay has championed this matter. The First Minister has put her views on the record. The letter is there too. Mr Finlay can pursue this matter in writing with the First Minister if she wishes. No. First Minister, it's, it's a point of order for me through the Chair, and it's simply a continuation of the debate we've had earlier. On that note, we're going to close First Minister's questions. We're going to suspend, I should say, and then we'll be back at 2.30 for, for portfolio questions. Parliament is suspended. <laughs>